Praise the Lord, dear family and friends. My heart is full of joy to be with you this morning. It is a blessing to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm praying for you, church. I want to I want to share with you a prayer that I'm praying for you and I ask that you pray this for me and for each other. Uh, if you ever take time, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, read those introductions to the many letters we have in the Bible. and You'll be uh, immensely blessed. But here's a prayer. Here's a prayer for the ages of prayer that I want to encourage your hearts today that God wants to fulfill and answer in each and every one of your lives. Can you say amen? Amen. Philemon, chapter 1, only one chapter in the book, verse 6. Listen to this prayer. Paul was praying for Philemon. He said that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Pray for me. I'm praying for you, church, that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Amen. Amen. That encourages me. You know, when we come uh, to hear the word of God, uh, you know, we come to study and hear the word of God. There's a purpose. Did you know that? We're not here for no reason. There's a purpose. Uh, and we have to be aware of that purpose so that we don't just uh, come casually or unattentively, um, Jesus says that unattentive hearers invite the devil to come and rob from their mind the very thing that God wants to implant. Is that what you want today, friends? I don't believe it is. We want God's seed, the word of God, to take root in our hearts and minds and to bear fruit. Can somebody say amen? Isaiah chapter 55, and I claim this for myself. It's an amazing task for anybody who stands before the people of God to declare the words of God. It's a task great, too great for any man. So I claim this in Isaiah 55 and verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Hallelujah. Friends, I think we've missed this. We haven't appreciated. A lot of times, even accidentally and unintentionally, as the people of God, we have sincere hearts, but we have blinders on our eyes. God said that his word prospers in its purpose. Can you say amen? It never fails. And many people have struggled with this, and the Bible addresses it elsewhere, that, wait a second, how does God's word not fail? Some people believe in our saved, and some people don't believe in our lost. Here's why it doesn't fail. What is the thing for which God sent it? A lot of times we read right over that little phrase in verse 9, how many people, want, how many people in here want bread to eat today? Amen, hallelujah, and by God's grace, I want to be faithful to my task to give you bread to eat. It's the preacher's task, amen, to bring forth the heavenly bread, right? Christ blessed the bread, break it, handed it to the disciples. The disciples had to hand it to the people. So we all want bread to eat, and guess what? God said his word was to give bread to the eater. Can you say amen? But did you see what else it said, friends? And this is why so many times we miss out on God's goodness and his abundance and his promises for our life. Because God's word is to give bread to the eater, but it's not just that. It says that the rain comes down to water the earth, that it may give seed to the sower. That's you, my friend. Everything you hear from this pulpit, from your own Bible study, at the prayer meeting, in the Sabbath school, etc., is to give you something to share with another that's in need. And God is saying his word does not fail. It will feed you. It will enable you to share the gospel of Christ with another person. Can you say amen? I need that confidence to speak to you 
that God will do that. He will feed us, but also give us seed to sow. And that's why in verse 12, have you ever caught what it says in verse 12? He says, for you shall go out with joy. Who's ready to go out today? Amen. Amen. God will bless us richly if we always come with that attitude. Come to the word as a recipient, but also come to the word with a willing heart saying, God, you're going to give me something to share with somebody else. Amen. With that in mind today, I want to make sure I'm uh, on the screen. Let's go ahead and God has given us a topic today. It is 1126 a.m. In one hour, it will be 1226 p.m. I have to accomplish my task within that time frame. I have to say that to myself. So bear with me. Thank you guys for your patience. Today, our subject is waving the white flag. Let us pray together and ask God to bless us in our contemplation of his word. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, you want to teach us the most powerful lesson, a most important lesson, the lesson that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again to teach and make real in the lives of his people. Holy Spirit, come and anoint us and teach us so that as you have taught us, we may abide in Christ. And let us abide in Christ so that when he comes, we will be without shame. In the name of Jesus Christ, we say, amen. Amen. Waving the white flag. Uh, so today, we are going to study Luke chapter 14, the last, chap the last verses in that chapter, verses 25 to 35. And I invite you to turn there with me in your Bible to read along with me. Luke and the 14th chapter, verses 25 to 35. I don't know how familiar you are with the Gospel of Luke. It's a very special book. A lot of times when we talk about the New Testament, we talk a lot about the Apostle Paul. Why might we talk a lot about the Apostle Paul? His radical conversion, his powerful testimony, he is undoubtedly the most influential Christian missionary other than Christ himself. And we often say that the Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Amen. And that is true if you are counting by the number of books. But when you count by the sheer amount of content, namely the number of words, Luke actually wrote the majority of the New Testament. That's how large the book of Luke and the book of Acts are when you put them together. They comprise the majority of the New Testament. And guess what? What also stands out about Luke is that he was not Jewish, he was a Gentile. This is showing God's desire in the New Testament to take the gospel to all the world as a witness to all nations. Can you say amen? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Luke's gospel is special for many reasons. You might ask, you know, okay, I get that it's all about Jesus. We need to understand the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, how he died for our sins and rose again as our Lord. But why four different accounts? Well, first of all, by the testimony of two or three witnesses, let every matter be established. And just in case three wasn't enough, God gave us four. A report is believable and verifiable and confirmable when you have multiple witnesses that agree. Each of the Gospels tells the same story, but they have a unique flavor. And as you grow in Christ, I encourage you, as you read your Bible, which I plead with you to read your Bible for yourself, read it verse by verse, praying to the Holy Ghost for understanding, not relying on any person's commentary or insight, but just letting the Holy Spirit make the words plain, teaching you how to study for yourself. You'll see that as you read the Gospels, they each have a unique flavor, and they each have a unique beauty, although you're seeing the same story. That unique flavor comes out in the Gospel of Luke, um, even if you just survey. In the first chapter, he tells us who he's writing to. He says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So Theophilus is uh, believed to be uh, a nobleman of Roman citizenship. He knew Luke. He was a man of importance and obviously a man of wealth. How do we know that Theophilus was a man of wealth? Well, this was not a time where you could write your book on Microsoft Word and send it to Amazon and have it direct to print. If you commissioned somebody to write a book, you had to have money. You had to be a person of means. Everybody didn't have books on their shelves in their library. They did not have the Kindle app on their iPad. Books were not as common. So for... Theophilus, to be able to commission Luke to write this account of the life and teachings of Jesus for him, shows he was a man of means. That means that he was providing for Luke, paying him a salary for however long it took Luke to compile uh, these stories, these narratives that make up his gospel. And why? Why did Luke take this time to write to Theophilus? What is the unique flavor of Luke's gospel? Luke chapter 1, verse 4, he says, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. His unique flavor is to give us certainty to know verifiably the truth as it is in Jesus. Whereas John focuses on the signs Jesus performed and how those signs prove beyond shadow of doubt that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing in him, we can have life in his name. And Mark focuses on the service of Christ, that Jesus Christ came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew focuses on Jesus as the king and gives us the fullest account of his proclamations, his teaching. But Luke wants us to understand the certainty of those things which had been taught about Christ. And how does Luke go about doing that? It's very interesting. Uh, in Luke chapters 1 to 9, he gives an account of Jesus doing his ministry in the regions of Galilee and Judea, as do the other gospel writers. But in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, he says, Now it came to pass, when the time had come, for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And the, uni the unique flavor of Luke's gospel is that he spends the majority of his book writing about Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem. Chapter 9 to chapter 22, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to be hated, to be rejected, mistreated, to suffer, and to die for our sins. And it's something about watching Jesus as he travels that reveals to us in a special way his humanity. Anybody in here travel a lot? Traveling takes a lot of energy, doesn't it? Just the act of going from one place to the next, from picking up and moving out and settling down in another place for just long enough and then moving on, especially when you travel with a group of people. And Jesus was often traveling with who? His 12 disciples. So we see a special picture that Jesus is indeed the Son of Man. Unto us a child indeed was born. Unto us a son was given. That God came to be a part of the human race. And what do we see Jesus doing as he travels? Yes, he preaches to people. Yes, he heals the sick. But he also interviews people. One-on-one -on -one conversations. He also eats with people. He teaches his disciples. He also invites children to sit on his lap. All of these things happen as Jesus is traveling. He has dinner. He eats Sabbath lunch with a ruler of the Pharisees. 
That's actually the beginning of our chapter in chapter 14. And here we see a, a scene in Luke chapter 14, finding our way to our home today, Luke 14, verse 25. As he travels in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, it says, Now great multitudes went with him. So Jesus is traveling, and it's not a few people who are following him, but many. In other words, Jesus was a human. He took on flesh and blood. The plan of salvation required that Jesus come and participate in the nature and experience of humanity. The nature and experience, my dear friends, of humanity includes when Jesus travels and preaches and teaches as he gains popularity, how does he respond to the crowd? Does Jesus get beside himself? Does he become overwhelmed with pride? Does he lose his footing, his stability, his close connection with God because now he is concerned about the approval of people that have come to him because they've seen his work and they've heard his message? Is that how Jesus responds to popularity? You see here in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35, Jesus teaches us some very important lessons about himself, and ultimately, in these verses, we see a call to true discipleship. A call to true discipleship. And we have to modify, because many people follow Christ. How many people? As he traveled, it said, great multitudes, could be thousands. Many people are following Christ, at least physically, on foot, walking behind him, curiously looking above the crowd, trying to see where is he going now? What's he doing next? Who is he talking to? Who's that coming to see him? Many people followed him in that sense, but Jesus wanted to show what does it truly mean to follow him in the highest and most important sense, namely to be his disciple, to be a spiritual student of his. A disciple was not just a person who followed on foot, but who followed the ways, the lifestyle, the manners, the customs, the teachings. They would leave their profession. They would live with the rabbi or the teacher or the master, and they would seek to follow his pattern in all ways, looking through his outward actions, trying to catch a glimpse of his heart and mind that inspired the actions. This was a part of the culture nowadays. We see it reflected a little bit today. There are celebrities. There are influencers, right? We live in an influencer generation. Our world is experiencing a massive communication shift. Through social media, people can become influencers. You can go on YouTube. You can go on Instagram. You can go on TikTok and through videos and through pictures and through posts. You can talk about health. You can talk about fitness. You can talk about riding bikes. You can be an engineer and talk about how to build things and how to repair things. You can talk about cooking. You can talk about raising children. And in all of these things, you can become an influencer. You can talk about news, sports, politics, just about for everything you can imagine, there's an influencer. As a matter of fact, one of the things I found myself watching just because it's interesting there are people on YouTube who clean carpets. And they get millions of views because they take these horrendous, old, dirty rugs, I mean, just absolutely soaked and soiled with mud. And they clean them, and they make them like new, and they make money selling these rugs and money by getting people to watch them clean rugs. Many influencers. But Jesus was an influencer. In his time, influencers, it wasn't just enough to click subscribe or to become a follower. You wanted to be like this person in heart and mind and life. And so Jesus wants to show us what does it mean to truly follow him? Because in his time, many people followed him on foot. And in our time, 
many people follow Christ as far as claiming to follow him. So we must understand, what does it truly mean to follow? Many people call themselves Christian, especially in the United States. Now, admittedly, this number is decreasing, and many of the church leaders are worried that less and less and less people year after year are identifying as Christian. But many people, millions, tens of millions of Americans still identify as being Christian. Why is this so serious, my friends? Because it's not just enough to say we follow Christ. It's very interesting. We live in an age where one of the greatest arguments that faces us right now is that people want to identify as something that they are not. And this whole thing about, I was born biologically one way, but I want to identify as something else. This is not about politics. This is about faith. It is a satanic delusion for us to delude ourselves and think that we can identify as something that we actually are not. For example, why is this so important? Because Jesus is saying, many people identify as his follower. They identify as a Christian but they were not actually born by the Spirit of God. I want you to consider the seriousness of this, my dear friends. For example, when Jesus says in Matthew in chapter 7, verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says, to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody that identifies as a Christian will be accepted into God's kingdom. But who? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The person, not the person who says Lord, Lord, but the person who actually has a relationship with Christ where he is their Lord and they do the will of his Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These people had a religious experience and were very active in ministry. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, I want you to fear, I want you to feel the fear and sobriety that should come to your heart when you hear that passage. That people on the last day, will be fully expecting to enter the kingdom of heaven. They are fully certain and assured that they are saved. But Jesus says, I never knew you. You identified as something that you were not actually. Friends, Satan is a very subtle deceiver. These cultural, societal issues that face us, yeah, they become a big deal with politics. Should we affirm trans rights? Should we allow gender affirming surgeries for children? Those are real issues, but the deeper issue is, as Christians, should we be silent while people accept the delusion that I can identify as something that I'm not actually? Because if you're, if you're trying to identify as something that you're actually not, that means you ultimately think you can identify as one of God's people when you're actually not. And Jesus tells us of the fate and destiny of such ones. And we should care about and love the souls of people enough to be a witness in a perverse generation. So it's a call to true discipleship, friends. And it leads us to ask the question, what is true discipleship? What is true discipleship? Now, I know all of us, including myself, because largely of this media we all suffer from a short attention span, so I find that it is helpful just to lay out up front what do we see in the passage before us? How does this passage, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35, how does it answer this question? What is true discipleship? And what we see here in this passage 
is simply this. True discipleship is a calculated commitment. It's a calculated commitment. And also we see here today that true discipleship is a continual consecration. Jesus speaks to the people, the multitudes that follow him. He lays a heavy charge to them, makes a demanding requirement of them, and he uses several illustrations and parables to explain that. In that, simply answering the question, what is true discipleship? It is a calculated commitment and a continual consecration. Let's look at that calculated commitment that Jesus calls us to. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now we saw, it says, great multitudes went with him. And notice, how does Jesus react to the multitudes? It says, he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus tells the people that I see you following me on foot, but that's not enough. If you don't meet the requirement, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus is showing us by example uh, the calculated commitment. What does it cost to be a follower of Jesus? It costs something to follow Christ. It's one of the mysteries of our faith. It's one of the tensions that we grapple with. It will be the most fruitful study of your life to contemplate and to ask, God, how is it that salvation is a free gift given to me that I have nothing to do with, nothing to contribute to, yet you demand such a high standard of me? Reflecting on that one question will bring so much fruit into your life. But Jesus is saying it costs something. In other words, he's showing us the commitment to following him requires that you be willing to tell the truth. You have to be willing to tell the truth. This was a perfect opportunity. Jesus had gathered multitudes. He had gathered interest. He had gathered a crowd. This was a perfect opportunity for him to sit down with the disciples and have a board meeting. And this was a perfect opportunity for them to analyze what are the latest methods, what are the latest trends? How can we keep all these people we have gained? That's a lot of what is talked about in church growth settings today. We finally got a lot of people. How can we keep them interested? How can we share the message so that people like it more? But that's not what Jesus did. He simply told the truth that it caused something to be his disciple. And you, if you will follow him, you have to be willing to tell the truth. And I notice so many Christians that struggle with this today, and we fall short on this point today, that ultimately, one of the reasons why the church is so evangelistically dead and barren is because people don't realize, church members don't realize, our individual responsibility to share the truth with our friends and neighbors. And we have totally abused the concept, a concept of friendship evangelism, that yes, we should seek to be people's friends, we should be kind and loving, but we've got this thing in our head, and it's obvious in the lack of fruit that we bear of souls coming to Christ, it's very obvious that we have this idea that I have to be so buddy, buddy with a person before I can tell them anything about Christ to the point where you see that for years and years we're befriending people and eating with them and hanging out with them, and Christ has not entered the conversation yet. I understand what you're thinking. Yes, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 tells us we must speak the truth in love. Can we say amen? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 tells us we must share the truth with gentleness and respect. Can you say amen? Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, he tells us we must not be hypocrites as we share the truth with others. We must not have glaring inconsistencies in our life while we talk to the world, but we must be willing to tell the truth. Jesus was willing to thin out the crowd. Can you say amen? As a matter of fact, he saw this opportunity of all these people gathering as just the time. Okay, 
Now there are many people following. It wasn't time to say, all right, we want to make sure that we don't offend anybody. We want to make sure that nobody gets their feelings hurt. No, he said, now's the time to provide a test. And I know the struggle in my own heart. I know the struggle, and you know, if you've ever shared your faith, we have truths that everybody loves to hear. We have truths that everybody flocks to. Who doesn't want to hear that God loves them? Who doesn't want to hear that God has a good plan for their lives? Who doesn't want to hear that God has opened a way of salvation, that they can live forever in his perfect kingdom? Don't we want to hear that? That God will bless you. That God will help you. That God has solutions to all the problems of your life. Can you say amen? And as Jesus teaches us, yes, it is wise in our witness to lead with those things that are attractive. Lead with those things that are affirming. Lead with those points on what we all agree. But friends, at a certain point, the testing truth has to come and weed out the shallow and the false. That's how Jesus taught. The sower sows the seed. The majority don't receive it. They don't bear fruit, but it's a small group. The gospel net goes out and catches all kinds of fish. But when they're brought to shore, they have to be separated. Wheat and tares grow up alike. But in the end, there will be an obvious division. In the end, God will separate the sheep from the goats. There is a testing truth. We can't be afraid to say that we are saved by grace through faith. That not ourself, of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But we can't be afraid to say that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, what he planned for us beforehand, that we should walk in them. We can't be afraid to tell the world, friends, that if you truly believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, when you understand that Sunday is a historical deception and perversion of God's law, and that the Bible calls his people to honor and reverence the seventh-day Sabbath, you're going to obey and follow. That's a testing truth. That you're saved by grace through faith, through the righteousness of Christ alone, but if you have received that gift, you're going to care about how you treat your body and understand that Jesus has teachings about how you dress, about how you eat, how you present yourself to the, word, to the world. The things that go in our mouths and the things that come out of our mouths, Jesus cares about all of that. It's a testing truth. It's a testing truth. It's a shame. So often, when we tell the truth, that obedience to God's law is required. Obedience to the law of God is the fruit of a real relationship with Christ. It really burns my heart a little bit when I hear somebody say, well, the thief on the cross was saved. He never kept the law. That's not an honest response. An honest person would never look at the thief on the cross as an excuse for continuing in sin. Why? Because the thief on the cross did obey. He confessed with his mouth that Jesus was Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And guess what else he did? He preached and he rebuked the other thief. Don't you know we deserve what's coming to us, but this man is righteous. So don't say that he didn't obey. He obeyed within the opportunities that he had left in his life. Can you say amen? amen. And a true follower of Christ will obey Christ within the opportunities you have left. You'll be baptized as a believer in Jesus. You'll keep the Sabbath. You'll strive for holiness and purity of life. Jesus told the truth. Think about the commitment that you're making. Are you willing to tell the truth? Friends, we have to repent. Every warning and rebuke from God is an invitation of mercy to repent and discover his faithfulness and goodness like we've never known it before. We have to repent of our fear that for telling the truth, we'll be looked down upon, talked about, treated as silly, 
possibly, ultimately even hated. Friends, it's going to happen. It's not a maybe. It is going to happen. I want us to understand this today. Um, If we just read the words of God and actually took the words of God to heart, we would be much more clear about these things than we now are. Jesus said very clearly, John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Okay? Verse 22, Jesus said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Guess what? That means Jesus told people about their sin. Studying with a gentleman recently, and the topic of the Sabbath came up, and I believe he saw very clearly how Sabbath keeping is a genuine expression of New Testament obedience, that for a born-again heart, it is an expression of joy and love in Christ to honor his Sabbath. He saw that clearly, but then he wanted to say, you Seventh-day Adventists are always condemning everybody. You're going to tell me if I don't keep the Sabbath, I'm going to hell. I never said that to him. You know what? His mind said that to him. His conscience recognized the truth of that. Friends, we have to tell people the truth, which means telling them about their sin. And we can't be so afraid of the response that we withhold truth. And I know a lot of times we have good intentions and want to soften down the message a little bit. It's good to have good intentions. Just make sure that your good intentions are always backed up by God's instruction. So back in Luke, we see Jesus gives us an example to tell the truth. And he goes on, friends. Uh, 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 as a true disciple, we must be willing to tell the truth. As a true disciple, we must be willing to, for- willing to forsake family. He says we must hate our father and mother, and we must hate our wives and our children. A lot of people struggle with this verse. This is one of those verses maybe a little tricky to interpret. You have to understand that the word love and hate can also mean the word accept and reject. He's not saying hate as in treat your family with animosity. He's saying when it comes down to it, if you have to choose between your family and Christ, you choose Christ. Because if you have come into the kingdom, if you have believed in Christ as Lord and Savior, you have entered into the family of God. You recognize a commitment to a higher family. I love the time. There was a time, I want you to realize that Jesus' own family truly did not accept him. His own mother had questions about him. His own brothers outright rejected him. And so uh, Jesus had to answer this question. He said, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. We have to be willing to forsake family. Let me speak some truth to you today. Friends, so many of us spend year after year hoping to win the heart of a lost loved one, a lost child, a child, a spouse, a friend that has turned away from God, and we plead with them, and we try and we pray for them. Friends. It's not right for us to give undue attention to lost family members and not go out into our own communities and neighborhoods and seek those who will do the will of God if they simply hear. Because who is your real family? Ultimately, you do everything. Love them, pray for them, communicate lovingly to them. But ultimately, if they're not accepting, you got to know when it's time to move on and say, I got to go find out where God's real family is. I know that's not something that's easy to say amen to. I can show you a lot more about that. Is that one of the sins we commit against God is showing an undue attention towards lost family members when they've made their choice. They've had their chance. They've heard once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. Between the stripes of good and falsehood for the true or evil child. You got to know and say, Lord, friends, and I promise you, I promise you, I guarantee a lot more of you would see more interest. You would see more interest from your lost relatives if you say, God, I've talked to my children. I've talked to my parents. I I, I love them. And Lord, you have to send somebody, do something to save them. But if you would just covenant in your heart with God and say, God, while you work on my family, 
I'm going to go out here to your law, sons and daughters. And I'm going to care for them and I'm going to love them. Because I guarantee you somebody out here is of the family of God. They just don't know it yet. They haven't heard clearly yet. They haven't had all the same opportunities that we've had. But when it comes, they will say yes to Christ. I guarantee you, you'll see more. As a matter of fact, your lost children, dear friends, your lost loved ones need to see you zealously and aggressively pursuing the lost in your neighborhood and community because then your appeals will mean more to them. We have to be willing to forsake family. Our highest devotion is to the family of God because guess what, friends? Blood is thicker than water. Can we say amen? But I want to let you know today that blood is thicker than blood. That means the blood that Jesus shed for you and me is thicker than the blood DNA I share with my biological family. It's a calculated commitment. You've got to actually think about what it means to follow Christ. You have to be willing to lose your life, right? We have to hate our own life also, reject our own life if God calls us to that ministry of testifying to the truth with our life. And that points forward to the ultimate reality. Friends, none of us knows today if this will be our calling. And guess what? Let's not be foolish like Peter. None of us knows that if given this test, that we would successfully pass it. So don't be foolish like Peter saying, oh, if everybody else forsakes you, I will go to prison and even go to death for you. Let's not be foolish and self-confident. This is the, we have to accept this as the potential ultimate result. We have to accept that God may so ordain it that we enter his kingdom through a heinous, murderous death at the hands of those that hate the truth. But pastor, how, okay, that, that may happen. How do we prepare for that? We don't self-confidently claim that we're ready for that. Well, that's why Jesus says you also have to be willing to carry your cross. Losing your, losing your life is the ultimate result. Carrying your cross day by day is the painful process. Did you hear what Jesus said in verse 27? And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Very clear words Jesus spoke. Carry your cross is a day by day decision. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it once before. In Luke 9, verse 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's the painful process of humbling self, of being a living sacrifice. You see, friends, in the old covenant, they had dead sacrifices. The animal was slain. And so when the animal was slain, and its blood was drained, and its body was cut and placed on the altar, the animal had no choice as whether or not to remain. It was going to remain on the altar. But in the new covenant, what Jesus wants is a living sacrifice, a living person who will lay on the altar and stay on the altar. That's carrying your cross. Carrying your cross means denying yourself. It means Jeremiah 10, verse 23 I know that it is not in man. It is not in man to direct his steps. Lord, I'm not wise enough to arrange and order the affairs of my life. Carrying your cross means enduring the painful battle against sin and temptation, looking your own weakness in the face and understanding that it's only through Christ that we can overcome, but that we can indeed overcome. It means rejecting your own righteousness, any thought that you are righteous or can somehow make yourself righteous or that you can present anything about yourself that is acceptable or approvable unto God. It's the painful process day by day of humbling ourselves. This is the hard work of salvation, friends. Doing God's will is not hard. Psalm 40, verse 8. The psalmist says, I delight to do your will, yea, your laws within my heart. Duty ought to be a delight. Sacrifice ought to be a pleasure. What's hard is the process of humility we have to go through, forsaking all of our pride, forsaking all of our own wisdom, 
and laying it at the feet of Christ. The painful part is having our glory laid in the dust, everything we think is good about ourselves. And it's a daily matter. It returns to us often. It's not a one and done. It's a daily realization that I see nothing good in myself that is in my flesh. It's a daily realization that in and of myself, apart from Christ, I will always fail, I will always fall. It's a daily realization that without Christ, without the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, even if I want to do the right thing, I won't have the power to carry it out. Even if I hate to do the wrong things, I will do them. Carrying your cross. The hearers would have understood. They lived in the Roman Empire. They understood that rebels against the Roman Empire would be executed publicly under the heinous act of crucifixion and that it wasn't just the act of crucifixion, but it was the humiliating process of being marched naked through the streets with a wooden cross on your back. Jesus is saying, if you are my follower, be ready to be hated, mistreated, and rejected and go through the painful, humiliating process of carrying your cross. You see, the multitudes at that time, friends, they were looking forward to Jesus defeating the Romans, doing away with the Romans, exalting the Jewish nation. They weren't looking forward to having to endure the humiliating, denigrating punishment of being crucified and carrying a cross for Christ. Just like many Christians today, they want blessing. They want prosperity. They love the word of God because the word of God has so much wisdom to help us with all the trials of life. They want the word of God to give them motivational principles of how to stay encouraged when times get tough and how to have a clear mindset. They want the word of God and they want a preacher to tell them this is how you can accomplish all your goals and fulfill all your dreams. Here are six steps to ultimate happiness. Six steps to overcome your anxiety. They love that. But they don't realize that that peace and freedom in Christ comes through the painful process of crucifying self, turning against entirely our selfishness, our self-worship, and our self-will. Jesus says, if we are to follow him, we must count the cost. One of his most powerful parables. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Friends, count the cost. It's not once saved, always saved. If it was once saved, always saved, there would be no need to say this man began to build and was not what? Able to finish. You think about that? You have to meet that deception very often. And friends, I know Adventists, we technically don't believe once saved, always saved on paper, but we practice it. We think that the, the decision we made for Christ some time long ago is what's going to sustain us through every day and the time of trouble and the coming crisis. Friends, it's a moment-by-moment moment abiding surrender. Thank you, Sister Lisa, for having us sing that song. We must learn what it means personally and practically, moment-by-moment, moment, to be kept by his love. Count the cost. Are you willing day by day to come to Christ for repentance and renewal? Are you willing day by day to seek him? Friends, why do I have so many points lined up under this? It's because Jesus wants you to think. That's what this whole section, being a disciple is a calculated commitment, something you must think about and honestly say, is this what I want? And guess what? If you're anything like me, you're going to look at the commitment that Christ is asking of us, and you're going to say, you know what? There's going to be a part in you, a part of you called the old man, a part of you we refer to as self, a part of you in other places the Bible calls him the flesh. There's going to be a part of you when you see what Jesus asked for, and guess what? That part of you is going to say, no. I don't want this. Maybe as you listen, you're saying, I don't want this. This doesn't sound like what I signed up for. This doesn't sound like 
the Jesus I've built in my mind because I haven't actually read the word of God, but I've practiced a cultural Christianity. There's going to be a part in you that says, this is not what I want. But guess what? Even if you say this is not what I want, Jesus calls us to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I really don't want this, but I know I need it. So make me willing to be made willing. Help me. Save me in spite of myself. My weak, unchristlike self. And here's where the title of our sermon comes from today. Friends, we must be willing to fly the flag. In verse 31, it says, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Can I help you interpret that parable this morning? God, your creator, your savior, is the king that has 20,000. You are the king that has 10,000. Your whole life you have warred and fought against God, though God is your friend. In Romans 8, verse 7, it says that the carnal mind is enmity against God because it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Our whole lives we war and we fight against God. We are like Jacob when he was praying for his life and Christ met him by the brook and touched his shoulder and Jacob spent all night fighting with Christ like he was an enemy. And he wasn't ultimately saved. He wasn't ultimately blessed until he realized Christ was not his enemy, but his friend. But this is telling us the truth about ourselves. We treat God like an enemy to be hated. God says, keep my commandments. We say they're too hard. God says, obey. My standards for living is too high. God says, sacrifice yourself. That's too much. So we treat him like an enemy. But Jesus is saying, think about this. Think about this. Can you actually beat God? If you're going to fight against God, are you ever going to win that fight, my friend? No, you won't. As it has been said in days of old, your arms are too short to box with God. Yet foolishly, we try. I'll make up my own law. I'll do it my own way. I will indulge in the same sins that the generations before me indulged in and think I will not have to pay the same consequences they pay. I'm going to sin and go to heaven anyway. I'm going to build an entire system of theology that explains how I can be saved and still sin. We fight against God. We fight against God. And we have to understand what Jesus says. Listen, in verse 32, he says, he says, what king going to make war against another king does it think about it? Can I actually win? Do I have any hope? Think about it, friends. You have no hope. You will not win in a fight against God. So in verse 32, or else, while the other king is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks what? Conditions of peace. Maybe you don't understand that language right off. That's okay. Jesus is saying, you realize you can't beat the other king. So you have enough sense while he's still a great way off. You tell the people on the watchtower, hey, put down our flag. We're no longer an independent nation. And what? Fly the white flag. Surrender to the opposing king because we can't beat him. If you can't beat him, friends, join him. Realize. And here's the thing, it's not only that you can't beat God, you don't have to beat God because he's not your enemy. He's your friend. So you wave that white flag and say, hey, we belong to you now. You have control. Friends, we have to fly the flag and we shouldn't be afraid to fly the flag in a day where everybody else wants to fly their flag. Some wants to fly a Confederate flag. Some, and it's terrible, they want to fly a rainbow flag. Friends, we should have never let the LGBT community hijack the rainbow flag. 
The rainbow surrounds God's throne. That's his covenant of mercy, saying that we can come to him and receive grace and in repentance and faith be made whole. I don't care if you are a gay sinner or a straight sinner. But they waved the rainbow flag. What a blasphemous sign, friends. The days of Noah, glorying in their shame. May God help us and may God help them. The transgenders want to fly a flag. Somebody got kicked off of Twitter because they proposed they made a flag for youth-attracted persons. I'll let you go figure out what that means. The evil that we face in this world today. Everybody else wants to fly their flag. We need to fly our flag. Our flag is the white flag that we are surrendered to Christ as Lord. See that rainbow flag? People are using that rainbow flag to say, I was born a certain way and I can't be changed. But I fly the white flag to say, we must be born again. Friends, my heart breaks for the trans community because I know this, friends. The Bible says in the beginning God made them male and female. My heart breaks for that community. Why? If I cannot accept the basic fact of creation, that I have a creator, and he chose what I am. He chose my gender. If I can't accept that basic fact, I can never accept his plan of salvation for my life. Our hearts should bleed for the people because they're suffering under satanic deception. I know you might be tempted to hate them and think evilly of them because they are so confused, but our hearts should beat for them and be praying, Lord, is there any way? And Lord, if there are any people like that that you put in my life, help me to love them and minister to them and share the gospel with them. So they fly a flag to say, I choose. But we fly the white flag to say, no, God, you choose. I've done it long enough my way. I've I've done my, my whole choosing, and I see it never ends up good. And like I already said, they fly a flag to say, I can identify as something I'm not actually. And I say, no, I fly the white flag to say, Lord, just as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous make me righteous Lord I'm unrighteous for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God Lord transform me Lord help me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind friends ultimately we have to abandon all Jesus says likewise whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Friends, think about it. It's a calculated commitment. Are you ready for this? You don't have to feel ready. You just have to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, make me ready. Whatever it costs to be your follower, Lord, I am nothing, but you can do all things in me. Just help me to be willing. We also saw that it was a continual consecration. Simply this, friends. The point of that next verse, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning, think about what does this mean? Jesus concludes his teaching in this section by pointing us to this illustration he used often of salt. Jesus was a master of using one illustration in many settings, many ways, drawing many principles out of one illustration. Friends, I want you to realize, if you have, I know I'm talking to a group of people, Somebody here says, I have thought about it, Pastor. I've prayed about it. I've sought God in his word. And yes, I want to belong to Jesus. I want him to be my Lord. I just invite you, make it continual. If you have come to Christ, the call to you and to me is abide in Christ. Don't waver. Don't be double-minded. Don't be drawn out of your standing with Christ by temptation, by deception, by the pressure of this life. Don't get so overwhelmed by the cares of this life that now you are prioritizing the affairs of this world and not the kingdom of God. Church, I beg of you, abide in Christ. If our pastors abided in Christ, they'd be more powerful. If our elders and deacons abided in Christ, our churches would have better, more spiritual leadership. If our members abided in Christ, the church would be a powerhouse to win the world. But we can't be in and out, friends. Jesus says when we come into his sheepfold, following his voice, we don't go in and out. 
The promises in Christ are not yea and nay, but they are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. John the Baptist was not a reed easily shaken by the wind. Friends, we have to come to the place where with David we say, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Not be moved from what? Beholding Christ, looking unto Jesus. He's the author and finisher of my faith. And I have the promise that he will keep me in perfect peace if my mind is stayed on him, if I trust in him. Trust in the Lord, for in Jehovah is everlasting strength. It's a continual consecration. Friends, it's the humility of remaining. Where does that come from, that word abide? It means to dwell. It means to live. What does that imply? That Jesus is your home. So my word to you is come home. And when you get there, stay at home. That's when you need to be on quarantine and lockdown. Come into Christ and don't go out for anything. Temptation will tell you sin is so enjoyable. Don't go out. Know your word for yourself so that you don't accept false doctrines that turn your weight, turn your heart from God gradually. In every pressure and trial of life, know that Christ is near. Don't leave out of Christ for anything. Can you say amen, friends? I want to say to you today, because if you lose your flavor, you lose your fitness. You can't be used by God to tell others about Christ if you don't have him abiding within. Don't you want to be fit to witness for Christ? Don't you want to be an example, a glowing example of the love of Christ? And guess what? The worse you've been, the weaker you are, the more hopeless you appear, the more glory belongs to Christ for your salvation and your transformation. Can you say amen? If that's the desire of your heart, can we stand together today? I want you to open your hymnal to number 330 and pray this prayer. Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated unto thee. Fly your flag, the white flag of surrender. You have abandoned control of your life to Christ to follow his word and to do his will. Number 330. Take my life and let it be.
Amen. Praise the Lord. It's been a blessing to fellowship with you. Um, you see the prayer cards. Feel free to fill one of those out if you have prayer requests. If you'd like me to call you or like to make a time to come and see you, I'd love to do that. You can let me know by filling out one of those cards and handing it to the deacon on your way out. Bow our, let's bow our heads together today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word. Thank you for giving us a call to true discipleship because we don't deserve to be your disciples. We deserve the lake of fire, for we have sinned and fall short. Thank you for sending your son into this world, born of a virgin. Thank you, Jesus, for purchasing the gift of righteousness with every act of your obedience, every act of love and service, every sin and temptation resisted. Thank you for that gift, and thank you for paying the penalty for our sins so that we can have that gift, so that your righteousness can apply to our account so that you can make a photocopy of your resume and your record and put it in our folder. Please, Lord, open our hearts to receive that gift today. Holy Spirit, come in and give us a new birth that testifies that we truly have believed and received the righteousness of Christ, that we are not our righteousness, that the world is not our righteousness, that sin and pleasure is not our righteousness, but Christ is our righteousness. We thank you for this. Give us a discipleship that is a calculated commitment and a continual consecration. Help us to retain our flavor and be fit to witness and work for you until Jesus comes. Lord, we just now pray your blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May all the people of Christ say amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, friends. Happy Sabbath. Thank you.